Sudden stratospheric warming, polar vortex. It's the cold season, so those winter buzzwords are coming back. What's going on, guys? Certified meteorologist Jonathan Keg is back with you. Now, what if I told you those words are actually meteorological and scientific in nature? However, more often than not, they're used incorrectly or just used to hype things up out of proportion. So by the end of this video, you're going to know exactly what they are and why you necessarily shouldn't be scared when you see these terms floating around social media. So we're going to start with the sudden stratospheric warming event. Again, that is a real thing, although it's a mouthful, because that kind of sets everything in motion with the polar vortex. We will break down in depth again over the next couple of minutes. So we're starting with the computer forecast here. This is in the stratosphere. The red and brown colors represent uh, warmer than normal temperature anomalies in the stratosphere. That's what we're looking at and the blue and green represents uh, the below normal temperatures in the stratosphere again with in relation to normal so i'll show you here this is the north pole right up in here the arctic circle here's the united states right down in there there's canada where i'm drawing that blue line just to give you some reference we're kind of taking the bird's eye view of the north pole to give you a reference point so let me take this out into the future here and taking you right down right down everything's still looking pretty good and then you see that big flare up right there mark it out of the white and brown that is a significant warming episode in the stratosphere, you see there is Greenland. It becomes a little more clear under that color. And then there is the North Pole, the Arctic Circle. And above that, 10 to 30 miles above our head in the stratosphere, it has suddenly warmed up. So that's a model forecast of how a sudden stratospheric warming event occurs. And we'll take that out further again, just so you can see even further warming. So that is a significant and sudden, in this example anyway, sudden stratospheric warming event. Okay, so I mentioned that SSW, that we can call that for short, but what that does when we get that abrupt and sudden warming in the stratosphere, it starts to disrupt the polar vortex. Now, couple of facts before we get into the nitty gritty of what the polar vortex is and how it can impact us indirectly in central Florida and across the lower 48 of the United States in general. What the polar vortex is, it's an area of low pressure both in the north and in south uh, on the South Pole. By the way, these are living, if you will, in the stratosphere, just where that sudden, a sudden stratospheric warming event took place. So these are not in the troposphere where humans live. These reside in the stratosphere, one at the North Pole, one at the South Pole. There is one in the troposphere where humans live, and we're going to get into that in a second. I know it's confusing. It's a lot, but we're going to break it down. The other thing is it's always present. So when you see things uh, and thumbnails of, oh, my gosh, the polar vortex is coming like the abominable snowman or something like that, it's not necessarily accurate because it's always present. Again, there's one at each pole, and they are miles above the surface, as you'll see in one second. It's weaker in summer and stronger in winter, and that's what the relative to the pole and relative to the hemisphere that you're in. We're going to be talking, obviously, about the northern hemisphere. And what the main takeaway is, again, the polar vortex is not a storm, but it can be disrupted by that sudden stratospheric warming event we just talked about and then send colder air from the poles, from the Arctic, right on down through Canada and into the lower 48. So, again, not a storm. It's a thing that's there, but it can be disrupted, and that's going to be the key as we go forward over the next couple of minutes. Okay, now we're going to get into it. So that pink area above the North Pole, across the Arctic Circle, that is the polar vortex. By the way, again, we are looking into the stratosphere with this, about 10 to 30 miles above our head. At the surface, we have something known as the tropospheric polar vortex, Polar jet stream, it's all right there. So the polar vortex, again, is not the polar jet stream. The vortex is a strong low. It contains Arctic air. When it is strong, all of that colder air stays bottled up over northern Canada through the Arctic Circle and right underneath that polar vortex into the poles. That's going to come into play in just one second. With the sudden stratospheric warming, though, we can see things get disrupted a little bit. So we were just talking again about when the vortex is strong or stable, and this is more often than not here. We have stronger low pressure, again, 10 to 30 miles above our head. The colder air is confined to the north underneath that vortex, and you have that very strong west-east flow. You see the arrows there going around the tip-top of the earth there. When the vortex... When you get that sudden stratospheric warming event, sometimes that flow stops completely or even gets reversed, and then that's what helps to send all of that colder air from the poles 
right on down to the south. So when we're talking about the impacts, and I kind of jumped the gun because this is what the graphic is going to show there. I wanted to show you graphically as well. But during a strong vortex, areas closer to the poles tend to be colder than normal. And then areas far south, so the southern half of the country uh, where we live, that is going to be typically warmer than normal. If you are a weather nerd and you like to follow uh, some of the oscillations that we have to measure things like El Nino, La Nina, the, there is one to follow for the polar vortex, the tropospheric polar vortex. That's the one that impacts us, uh, and that is the Arctic Oscillation. In this case, this is a positive Arctic Oscillation. Uh, when the Arctic Oscillation is positive, it means that we have the strong and stable polar vortex ahead, and it is colder where it should be to the poles. In the example now of when things get a little wild in the weather or when it has the potential to get a little wild, I'm talking big snowstorms. I'm talking big time cold getting really far south. That is when we have a weak polar vortex. So we had that sudden, stratic, sudden stratospheric warming event. Say that five times fast. You had that occur. The polar vortex has now been disrupted. It's not really the polar vortex coming to visit, so to speak. It's still there. It is just disrupted. A lot of times, though, and it's not every time, a lot of times that disruption makes its way to the surface, and it's the tropospheric polar vortex that actually sends down some of these surface level colder air, the Arctic air, the polar air that's hanging out well into the poles. So again, that polar vortex is always staying in the tro in the stratosphere, but there's also one where humans live in the troposphere, and that is what is actually, or pieces of it come off and then work its way a little bit further to the south. So what you need to know about this is whenever we have one of these sudden stratospheric warming events, the polar vortex can get disrupted. That can sometimes make its way down to the surface. The jet stream, as you see there, gets wavy. It buckles. And when the jet stream gets wavy and buckles, that's when we get storms to develop. And then that is uh, more susceptible to episodes of supplying Arctic air far south. You see it right there again, that big dip in the jet stream to the eastern third of the country in this example. It's pure Arctic air, pure polar air coming down as a result of the jet stream being wavy from that disruption that happened way into the stratosphere that made its way back to the troposphere where humans live again. So there's a lot going on here, but that is the reason why it's not technically that polar vortex that hangs out on top of the poles. It's, again, at the surface as a result of that disruption. So the impact here to us, and that's the main thing here, when the vortex is weaker, and again, in this example, it is a negative Arctic oscillation. You can follow that on some charts and things like that. When it trends negative, that means that the vortex is weakening. And when the vortex weakens, that helps the jet stream stay weaker. And when the jet stream is weaker, it can be bullied by other things. It gets wavy. And again, when the jet stream is wavy, it turns stormy. And it also allows colder air to plunge in places that not necessarily it is all the time. So again, that's kind of the in-depth version there. The cliff notes is when you have a weak polar vortex, when you after that sudden stratospheric warming event, you can get big storms, you can get cold, but it's not always a guarantee that the warming and the disrupted stratospheric polar, polar vortex impacts us at the surface. So there's a lot of things. And by the way, that surface impact typically comes one to two to three weeks after the sudden stratospheric warming event. So it doesn't happen instantly. It doesn't happen in real time like it does in the stratosphere. It takes a little bit for this disruption to make it to the surface in the time frame of about one to three weeks. So say, for instance, we get sudden stratospheric warming in the middle of December. We'll call it December 15th. You can expect if it is going to have an impact to the surface, maybe things get a little stormy first week of January. Again, if it in fact makes it to the surface. And again, the impacts for us, uh, we typically have the cold air outbreaks as a result of a big disruption of the polar vortex. Uh, and the extreme cold can come south. It certainly is sensitive. It does damage to crops. Hard freezes can make their way down into the deep south, into the state of Florida. And of course, wind chills. Likely going to be windy. It's going to be stormy somewhere. These things can have the tendency to also uh, bring... Big winter storms, when the jet stream is wavy like that, you obviously have warmer air coming south a little bit more, colder air dipping to the north, uh, cooler air moving north. Colder air moving south, warmer air moving back to the, to the north as well. That's how you get that battle zone and get those bigger winter storms to develop. So next time, when you hear sudden stratospheric warming, polar vortex, it could mean some cold is on the way. 
but it's not a giant storm. Could help it to create one, but just wanted to pass along what those buzzwords mean as you're likely going to hear that a lot through the colder months in the Northern Hemisphere.